and um, super excited about today. We're starting uh, our new class called Indwelling Life, Learning to Live by the Power of Christ in You. And I just have a great expectation for what God's going to do. I have a great sense of what the Lord's going to do. I just, I woke up just uh, excited today about what God's going to do. So I just want to encourage you to uh, just have your expectation raised up. I believe God is going to move among us. It's probably going to be talking about this for six months. I don't know exactly. I mean, there's about 20 sessions we're going to be looking at, but it'll probably take six months. But I believe God is going to do an incredible work, a deep work, like we were prophesying in the song earlier. God's going to do a deep work in us. And so I just want to raise your expectation for what God is going to do in you, an inward move of the Holy Spirit. So if you have your Bibles, go ahead and let's turn to Colossians chapter 1, verse 26. And you've, you've read this, I'm sure, many times. It's something we've talked about uh, often here in this, this church is God's ultimate intention, God's eternal purpose. And so Colossians 1, 26 through 27, Paul is writing in what is called one of his prison epistles. He's under house arrest as he's writing this. And, and Paul is, is unveiling to us the eternal plan of God, the eternal mystery of God that had been veiled for ages and for times past, but what's now being made known to the church. And starting in verse 20, 26, Paul said, The mystery which had been hidden from past ages and generations. And this was a mystery that very few of the prophets, maybe only Ezekiel, had insight into this. The patriarchs, the, po the prophets, even the angels didn't have insight into this. Paul called it a mystery, the apostolic mystery. Paul was revealing and unveiling to the first century church, the, the Colossian church now, the entire church, the mystery that was hidden within God from past ages and generations. It has now been made manifest to the saints. Verse 27 to whom God willed to make known what is the riches of the glory of the mystery among the Gentiles, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory. Those three words are absolutely profound. Christ in you. Don't let this just become head knowledge and buy stuff you quote and even talk about. But the revelation that Paul was unveiling in the first century of Christ in you, the eternal plan of God, before time and before creation, God had an eternal purpose, an eternal plan. Christ in in you. That is incredible. <laughs> I'm glad you're so excited about it. <laughs> Christ in you. You should be standing and jumping up and down in celebration. Awesome, awesome. Christ in you. What an incredible privilege we have. The angels who worship before the throne of God all throughout eternity past, gazing upon him, now looking upon the, the spirit of the redeemed, the spirit of the justified, that Christ, the one they worship, now is dwelling in the spirits of humans who are redeemed. Profound incredible, just amazing. No other created being has God's life in them. They relate to God externally, not internally, but us, those formed of dust, have God himself dwelling in us, Christ in you dwelling in us. Now the question is, what does that mean to you? 
What does that mean to you? Why is this important to your life? To understand what it means for Christ to dwell in you. Why is that important? Because I know this. You know, I know this, that if we don't understand the why this is important, as we, talk, as we jump into the indwelling life class of Christ in you, if we don't understand the why, we will zone out when we get into the what and to the how. If we don't understand the why of why this is important to me and why this is important to you and why this is important to us in this time and hour we live in, we will zone out when we get into the what and to the how. We need to know the why. Why is this important? Now, you know, even if you have kids, they always want to know why, why, why. And they always want to know, okay, Okay, why can't I do this? Why can't I do this? Why do I understand? Why, you know, why, 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 why? And you always just, because I told you to. You know, that never, ever worked with me. I drove my parents crazy. I was like, no, I don't want to just know I, I, because you said so. I want to know why. Well, we're wired to know why. <laughs> we're wired to know why. And so what I want to do in this introduction is just really get into the nitty-gritty of why it is important that we learn how to live by the indwelling life of Christ because the measure of study and effort you put into this class is going to be the measure that comes back to you and more will be added to it. And if you don't understand the why of it, then the amount of effort you put in and the study you put in and the prayer you put in over these six months will be very limited. But if you understand the relevance to you and into your life and especially to the times and seasons we live in, you will do whatever it takes and you will give it whatever effort is needed to learn how to live by the indwelling life of Jesus Christ. So I want to talk about here six reasons why why we need to learn how to live by the indwelling life of Christ. Number one is that it enables us to have a deep, intimate, internal relationship with the Lord. Learning to live by the indwelling life of Christ enables us to have a deep, intimate, internal relationship with the Lord. You may not realize this. You may just have thought God is just a religious and he just gives you these rules and all these do's and don'ts you must follow. And that is absolutely not who God is. Yeah, I mean, he gives us rules we have to keep. Yeah, for sure. But God is supremely, supremely relational. God wants a deep relationship with you. That's why I love what Audrey was singing. This is point, basically what Audrey was singing is point number one. So I think she got my nose somehow. Angie, did you send them to her in advance? So I don't know. But she was singing prophetically the, the invitation to fellowship with God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And that's actually right in my notes. Exactly what she was singing was very, I love being in a prophetic church because the singers and the musicians sing prophetically what the message is about without even knowing it. But God is supremely relational. And I talked about this when we went through the eternal purpose that before time and before creation, God the Father and God the Son dwelt within themselves by the Holy Spirit in this bond of intimacy and union that we cannot even fathom. Words fail to describe the intimacy and the union of relationship between God the Father and God the Son by the Holy Spirit, the ecstasy, the joy, the pleasure, the intimacy, the conversations that never end. I mean, we almost think oh, that sounds boring, but... I, the Trinity was never bored for one second. They were filled with ecstatic pleasure in the fellowship of the Trinity. God the Father and his love for his son was just, he just had so much love for his son that he wanted to share the pleasure of the Godhead with the creation, and that is you and that is me. You have been invited into, you have been invited into the eternal fellowship that God the Father and God the Son through God the Holy Spirit have shared for all of eternity. What an invitation. What an incredible invitation. God who is so relational invites you and invites me into the most incredibly deep, internal, intimate relationship with him. 
And it's by the indwelling spirit. It is by Christ in you that we come into that communion and that fellowship with God. God created you for his good pleasure. He did not create you for your good pleasure. God invite everything begins and ends with God. God did not create you to live your best life now. Jesus did not come to give you life like you, we think of in terms of our best life now. He came to bring you and to bring me into the eternal fellowship of the Godhead, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit before time and creation. You were invited, I was invited into that same fellowship of conversations in the Holy of Holies for all eternity. And you can enter into this now because Christ is in you. That is awesome. Christ is in you. Christ in you means you can now have fellowship with the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. You can fellowship with God right now, spirit to spirit. You don't have to wait and die and go to heaven. You can go deep in God without waiting to die to experience it. You have that right now because Christ dwells inside of you. You have access, that's what I was saying during worship, we have access to the Father by the indwelling spirit into heaven where Jesus dwells because of our spirit to spirit union with the Holy Spirit. You don't have to live far from God. You really don't. You, can, you, are, you are connected to him, and he is closer than your skin. You have a spirit-to-spirit -spirit union with the Holy Spirit. So the first reason that why this is important is because living by his indwelling life brings you into that fellowship that the God had yearned from before time and creation. The second reason why learning to live by indwelling life is important because it empowers you to overcome the world, the flesh, and the devil. You are called more than a conqueror in Jesus Christ. That's your position. But God wants you to be an overcomer in actual experience. God wants us, God wants me, God wants you, God wants us to overcome the world. How much do we need to overcome the world system today? It has gone absolutely woke and mad. We must overcome this woke world that has been pushed upon us by this antichrist system. We're called to overcome this world. We're called to overcome this flesh, <laughs> this soul that wants preeminence, that wants to rule and reign, that wants to bring us into sin, that wants to bring us into selfish living. We've called, been called to overcome that. And we're called to overcome the devil, demons, the powers of darkness. We're called to overcome. Let's turn to Romans chapter 5, 17, an incredible verse of scripture that I want you to see and get this. Wherever you are in life, whatever has defeated you, whatever has deceived you, wherever has limited your ability to go in and to go forward in the Lord, Romans 5, 17 is an incredible encouragement to you of what the Lord's heart is for you, he has not destined you to live in defeat. He has not destined you to live being overcome. He's destined you to be an overcomer. I love Romans 5.17, where Paul says, For if by the transgression of the one death reigned through the one, much more those who receive the abundance of grace, that means, we'll get into this, we have a whole session on the grace of God, the power of God in you that is not merited or earned, that enables you to be who God has called you to be and to do what God has called you to do, to become the person God has called you to be, that grace of God and the gift of righteousness, we'll have an entire session about that, the gift of imputed righteousness, God imputes righteousness to you and says you're justified no matter what you have done. He says, if you have those two things, you will reign in life through the one Jesus Christ. You're not called to live defeated. God has given you everything for life and godliness. God has given you everything to be an overcomer. The power of God in you empowers you to overcome the world, the flesh, and the devil. 
You don't have to live discouraged and defeated. You don't have to live without hope. You don't have to live a selfish life. You don't have to live a life bound by lust or deceit or anxiety or worry or whatever it would be. You don't have to live in bitterness and unforgiveness and offense. Christ in you gives you the power of God to overcome the world, the flesh, and the devil. You can live a victorious life as an overcomer because Christ in you has overcome and he will overcome in you and through you. See, in this hour we live in, Jesus is calling for overcomers. Revelation 2 and Revelation chapter 3, Jesus said to him who overcomes seven times, and he'd list out se several different things to overcome. Losing your first love, false doctrine, Jezebel, apathy, indifference, lukewarmness, um, uh, backing down in the face of persecution. So he lists all these things that would be common to the churches throughout history, and he says, to him who overcomes, to him who overcomes, to him who overcomes, to him who overcomes. And he challenges and confronts the church. And I believe he would do the very same, especially to the church in the Western world in this hour. He confronts the church, overcome, overcome. God is going to have an overcoming church at the end of the age. Depending on how, it depends on how big it is, whether it's a remnant or a, the full church, depends on whether or not we overcome. But my point here is because Christ lives in you, you have power to overcome. It's not something you have to do in your own human strength. It's a work of God in your spirit that empowers you to do it. Now, you've got to cooperate with it. You've got to say yes to it. You've got to agree with it. You've got to say more, Lord, and allow self to decrease and Christ to increase. But when Christ comes in and he possesses your heart, you are going to overcome because he's an overcomer. So le learning to live by the indwelling life of Christ empowers you to live an overcoming life. Number three is learning how to live by the indwelling life of Christ produces lasting fruit in abundance. John chapter 15, 1 through 11, the Lord calls, a lot of scholars call it the abiding life, the abiding life passage, where Jesus said, I've called you to bear fruit. I've called you to bear much fruit. I've called you to bear fruit that remains. He said, apart from me, you can do nothing. But as you abide in the vine, you will produce much fruit that remains. We are called to produce not by our own strength, but by the sap of the Holy Spirit who now dwells in our human spirit. And, that, and the Holy Spirit being released outward into our heart, into our soul, permeating our thoughts, transforming our emotions. That fruit is produced, the very nature of Jesus Christ. See, Peter talks about you have everything you need pertaining to life and godliness because the indwelling spirit is in you. You already have love. You may not feel like it, but you have all the love you need right now in your spirit because Christ dwells in your spirit to love God and to love others the way he commands us to love. You have already the joy you need to overcome despair and depression, gloominess and sadness. You have that joy inside of you. It just needs to be released but Christ in you is the joy you need to live a happy and joyful life. You have all the peace that you need to overcome stress, anxiety, and worry, and fear. The very Prince of Peace himself resides in your human spirit. The Prince of Peace himself resides in your human spirit. You don't have to be living in fear and anxiety and worry because Christ himself in you is your peace. The problem is your soul is living and your soul is filled with anxiety and stress and worry and that the soul living suppresses Christ in you who is your peace so that he's not released, he's suppressed. But as you learn how to let the spirit of God in you have uh, the reign in it, the, to reign, to be first, to govern, to rule rather than your soul, that anxiety and that stress you, you struggle with can be overcome because Christ 
is in you to produce peace. Patience. How many of you need patience? You have kids, you definitely need patience. And if they have parents, they definitely need patience as well. Patience. We need patience to deal with difficult people, to deal with people that are challenging. I mean, how many of you work with people that are perfectly easy to work with? I mean, we all need the patience of the Lord. We need, if you're married, you need patience. Okay? I'm not saying it about you. I, I, you need it for me more. But we need patience. And the thing is, we already have patience because Christ himself is in us as patience. His fruit is patience. See, meekness, you feel like you struggle with pride. You feel like you struggle with self-exertion and self-exaltation and self-wanting to live and self-wanting its way. You already have the meekness of Jesus Christ inside of you in your spirit. The problem is your soul, which is still not conformed into the image of Christ, is living. And when your soul is living and when self-life in your soul is living, then that that meekness of Christ is suppressed and you are not living that meek life where meekness may, basically means surrender and submission to the full will of God and to his voice. But you already have meekness inside of you. The key is learning how to tap into that meekness and release it outward to where that meekness comes out in the way you talk and the way you respond and the way you live, and how you obey. And so we already have that meekness inside of us. Self-control. How many of us feel like I need to be more disciplined in my spiritual walk? How many of us feel like, okay, there's one area I really lack. It's like self-control. I want to play video games rather than get into the Word. I want to get on social media rather than pray. I want to do all these things instead of spend time with the Lord. Self-control, the spiritual disciplines. Well, you already have those inside of you. They just, because Christ is in you, they just need to be released and to permeate your thinking, your emotions, and your will. And so... Learning how to live by the indwelling life of Christ helps you bear fruit by releasing Christ who is in your spirit outward into your heart, into your soul, into your body. Let's turn to Revelation 19.7. Number four is learning to live how, by the indwelling life of Jesus Christ helps make you ready as a bride for Jesus. Now that's something very important to this church. In fact, our entire mission is to make the bride of Jesus Christ ready. And this is a beautiful, uh, I love dad's class on the theology of the bride. It was just an incredible class. If you haven't, you haven't listened to it, highly recommend you get into it. Just laid out just line upon line through every single passage of scripture you could think about related to the bride showing the bride in scripture, showing the need to be made ready, showing that some in the church will make themselves ready, some in the church won't. But um, that class did not really get into, there was, there was just so much to get into. It didn't really get into too much, how do you actually do it? But this class gets into the details of how do you do it? Because learning to live by the indwelling life of Christ, if I could just say, okay, if someone was to ask me, okay, how do I make myself ready as a bride for Jesus? How do I make myself ready? If they ask that question, my first response would be, okay, learn how to live by the indwelling life of Christ. To me, if you learn how to live by the indwelling life of Christ, I'm not saying that's the only thing, but if you learn how to live by the inward life of Christ, Christ in you, if you learn how to live by that life, then you will make yourself ready as a bride for Jesus. Now let's look at what uh, John wrote in Revelation 19.7. Let us rejoice and be glad and give the glory to him. For the marriage of the lamb has come and his bride has made herself ready. Notice that this is not the Lord making the bride ready. Though the Lord is going to make the bride ready, God has a part, we have a part. God won't do our part, we can't do his part. But it's the, it's this, this particular verse is saying the bride has made herself ready, not God and his sovereignty making the bride ready. Notice what it says in verse 8. 
It was given to her to clothe herself in fine linen, bright and clean. For the fine linen is the righteous acts of the saints. It, just without getting into all the Greek, what this actually means is what we do from and with our salvation. What, in other words, the righteous acts that we clothe ourselves with as wedding garments are what do we do with our salvation? What do we do with Christ in us? What do we do in working out our salvation? See, th what this is really talking about is what do we do with the imputed righteousness that was given to us and we are now justified by faith in Jesus Christ? And what do we do with the imparted righteousness that has now made our spirit righteous and one with the Holy Spirit? What do we do in working out the imputed and imparted righteousness that has been given to us in, in new birth? What do we do with that gift of salvation to work it out? See, Paul said, work out your salvation with fear and with trembling. That is the very same thing that John is saying in Revelation 19, 7 and 8. Work out your salvation with fear and trembling. The bride has made herself ready by righteous acts. It's the very same thing. They're not different. It's the same thing. Is what we do to work out what has already been worked into us by the Holy Spirit. See, as you're going to see in this class, Christ in you is rivers of living water. Christ in you is the glory of God. Christ in you is truth, the anointing, the kingdom of God. Christ in you is all of these things. Christ in you has transformed your spirit, regenerating your spirit, resurrecting your spirit from, from death, making your spirit righteous, making your spirit complete, making your spirit holy, making your spirit Christ-like. Now, the question is, this, this one-third part of you that is in your spirit, that has all this has been done to you, can this be released outward into your heart, into your inclinations, into your motives, into your deepest desires, into your ambitions? And can self-life be crucified so Christ in you can live? Can he work out into your thinking and how you think, into your emotions, how you feel, into your will, how you choose? Can he work out what has been worked in? Because that determines whether or not we make ourselves ready as the bride of Christ. So learning how to live by the indwelling life of Christ means then that if I learn how to live by his life, I, at the same time, and making myself ready as his bride. And so, you know, we've talked about this so often in this, in this church is Jesus is not coming back. No matter how dark it gets, Jesus is not returning until his bride is made ready. Ephesians 5.27, he's coming back for a bride that is holy and blameless. He's coming back for a bride that is glorious. He's coming back for a bride that's filled with light. Now, I would not describe the church that way right now. Maybe a small, small, small remnant, but God wants more, way more than a small remnant. God wants everyone in his church to be made ready. Now, not everyone is going to be made ready. Some are just not going to be made ready. Not by God's choosing, but, but by their choosing. But how we work out what God has worked into us determines our wedding clothes for all eternity. Let me say that again because that's a deep statement. How we work out what God has worked in will determine our wedding clothes for all eternity. If we don't work out what God's worked in, it talks about in the book of Revelation, it'll be as if we're in heaven naked, not clothed with wedding garments. People will see your deeds and you'll be exposed because you'll be seen as one who did not make themselves ready. So it's a serious thing that, that we want to make ourselves ready. The theological term for this is sanctification. So we've already been justified. We're now in the process of being sanctified. This, that sanctification is what happens to our soul, to our mind, to our will, to our emotions. That sanctification happens as we allow Christ in us to live and self to decrease, Christ to increase, so he can possess our heart and fill our heart. See, I said this earlier, but you have a part to play in this, and God has a part to play in this. You can never do God's part, and he will not do your part. 
That's why we must cooperate with the grace of God. We must partner with the grace of God. And learning how to live by the indwelling life of Jesus Christ is how we do that. And I, I've, you know, I, I remember when I was teaching on the overcomer several years ago, I mean, those messages are challenging. If you've never read Revelation 2 and 3 with a humble heart and said, okay, Lord, speak to me, and he starts confronting your uh, lukewarmness. He starts confronting losing your first love. He starts confronting you tolerating Jezebel. I mean, they're, they're challenging, challenging messages. And I remember teaching those things, just the challenge it brought us, and even, even some getting into discouragement and uh, despondency and almost feeling like condemned and all that. If you don't have the foundation laid of learning how to live by the indwelling life of Christ, the call to overcome and the call to be made ready can leave you in a spirit of condemnation. Um, God's standards are, are, are not lowered by God's grace. They stay the same. Grace lifts us up to God's standard. And so learning how to live by the indwelling life of Christ equips us to make ourselves ready as the bride of Christ. Uh, living by working out what God's worked in is what it means for the righteous acts of the saints, that we are clothing ourselves with righteous acts, what we do from and with our justification. Number five is learning to live by the indwelling life of Christ is how we are conformed into the image and likeness of Jesus as a mature son of God. God is raising up sons. God wants to take children, the children of God in his church who are born of the Spirit, and he wants to mature us, and the Greek word is weos, weos, sons of God. God's great eternal plan, Romans 8, 29, is that he would conform us into the image of his Son. You have been destined. What a beautiful call we have. You have been destined before time and creation. Doesn't mean it's automatic, but God's plan is that you and I, is that we, the church, would be conformed into the image of Jesus Christ. What an incredible calling that is. That we would look, the Father would look down upon his people, his body, and he would see his son, a perfect reflection of his son within his people is the lamb's nature has been worked into the people of God. Man, that's an incredible calling. God's eternal plan and eternal purpose is to conform us into the image of his son. The Holy Spirit is now working as the child trainer. I mentioned this in the eternal blueprint class. The Holy Spirit is now working as a child trainer to sand away those things in your soul that are not like Christ. Your pride, my pride, selfishness, uh, whatever it is, bitterness, lust, ambition, jealousy, anger, those self-issues that come out as fruits of the flesh. The Holy Spirit is sanding down. He's chiseling away. He's crucifying. He's putting to death that flesh nature in you so he can conform your mind, will, and emotions to the very image of Jesus Christ. God is going to have a corporate son at the end of the age. Just like Jesus is going to have a bride, the Father is going to have sons. And they're the same group of people. It's just relating to the, the, different, to the Father and to the Son. So the Son's going to have a bride. The Father's going to have sons. But God the Father is going to have a company of sons who he's going to look down upon and say, these are my beloved sons in whom I am well pleased. They are not the children of God. They are the sons of God. They're, they don't remain in immaturity. They don't remain just born again, but the born again work in their spirit not worked out into their heart, soul, and body. No, these are those, Romans 8, 14, those who are led by the Spirit of God, these are the sons of God, the weos of God, the mature sons of God. God is wanting to raise up the mature sons of God in this hour. All creation is groaning and longing for the revealing of the sons of God. And I believe we live in an hour when God is going to reveal to creation his sons, his mature sons, even before he returns, he is going to reveal to creation who's groaning and longing. He's going to reveal to creation 
this company of people that you call weak and you say they're weak and they're helpless and they don't know what they're talking about, God's going to look at them and say, no, these are my sons in whom I am well pleased. And they're going to be a representation, a mature representation of Jesus Christ in the earth before he returns. Man, that's what I want. I want this in me. I want this in us. Learning how to live by the indwelling life of Jesus Christ is how that happens. Learning to cooperate with the Holy Spirit as he chisels away your pride, your selfishness, your self-life, you wanting to cling on to things, you wanting to live rather than him. That is the child training work of the Holy Spirit. And if you've ever been in that process, when you want to do your own will and God says others may but you cannot you understand that's not fun because the Holy Spirit is putting to death self life the, you living you being in control so Christ in you can have full preeminence in you in your soul so Christ in you can rise up and you can decrease see that's what God is after God is after those sons of God He forms within us the nature and the character in our heart and soul of Christ, developing the nature of the Lamb within us. That's what I want. That's what you want, I'm sure, I hope. The nature of the Lamb, the Lamb's meekness, the Lamb's love, His humility, His kindness, His self-sacrifice, that nature of the Lamb formed from the inside, it's not formed from the outside. Formed from the inside as Christ in you lives rather than you. That's how we do it, by learning to live by the indwelling life of Jesus Christ. Number six is learning how to live by the indwelling life of Christ equips you to stand strong during the trials and tribulations of these end times. So whether you're going through a trial in your life, whether it's a health, financial, relationship, crisis, whatever kind of crisis you're going in, you're experiencing, or, which would be common for us, if we're experiencing the unique pressures of the end of the age, the birth pains that lead to the second coming of Christ, whatever it is, trials and tribulations, common to all ages or unique to the end of the age, we, we need to learn how to live by the indwelling life of Jesus Christ because that is the only way that we're going to be able to stand strong in these end times. I love the verse that Shelley read today is that those who have insight and those who are, are being purged and purified in this time is that God is going to cause a, a group of people to shine like the stars. That those who have insight, those who know their God are going to display strength and take action. See, God is not coming back for a weak church, an inglorious, unholy church living in the corner from the Antichrist, cowering in fear. He's coming for an overcoming church. This idea of the church that's been pushed down upon us that we're going to be raptured out of here and we're going to just, you know, or we're going to just, we're afraid of the Antichrist or whatever, that's not an incorrect, or that is an incorrect view of Scripture. I'm not going to go into all that right now, but I'm saying... God is not coming back for a weak church. God is coming back for an overcoming church, a glorious church on the earth filled with the glory of God. God is coming back for a people that are strong and standing strong at the end of the age. We're not going to give our, bow our knee to fear. We're not going to, we're not going to be cowards as the pressures increase. Okay? I believe the Lord's coming back in 10, 15, 20 years. I'm not putting a number on it. I'm not saying 88 reasons why Jesus is coming back. You know, I, I've told that story before. I won't tell it again. But, you know, every prediction about when Jesus is going to come back has been wrong. So no one's going to be able to predict exactly when he's coming back. But I do believe we're living in that, in that season of his return. We're living... You know, the days of Noah were like 120 years from, from when God pronounced judgment until the judgment came, 120 years. And so I believe right now we're living in the days of the Son of Man, 
Jesus said the days of Noah will be like the days of the Son of Man. These are not just one day of the Son of Man. It's the days of the Son of Man. It's a period of time in which God unfolds many unique things related to the end of the age. We are living, not undoubtedly, we are living at the end of the age. If you don't think you are, just get on Twitter and you'll find out, okay, this world isn't crazy. This world's gone insane. We've gone insane. We are living in the days of Noah and in the days of Lot. And so God is not looking for a church that's going to run away in fear of what's coming, but he's raising up a strong church who will not be shaken when everything that can be shaken is released. God has said, I will shake yet again everything in the heavens and in the earth so that what remains is unshakable. God wants us as his people to be that unshakable people who are not moved in the time of great shaking. We're living in that time. I believe 2020, we crossed over into a new era. We crossed over into the, the beginning of birth pains increased to a level we haven't, in our lifetime we haven't experienced. All that, went, all that happened, the coronavirus, the political polarization, the tyranny in governments and government overreach and all that we experienced, all that happened, you know, it was, just, it was such a mess. All that happened, I believe we crossed into a new era that we're not going back to 2019. We've crossed into the end of the age. So we're living at the end of the age. And the question is, are we going to put our head in the sand and cower in fear and say, okay, I would rather be born in a different age. Or are we going to realize, no, this is the church's finest hour. This is the church's finest hour. This is an incredible, I mean, just think about this. If you're under 40, I believe with all my heart, you're going to witness you're going to witness Jesus Christ coming back. I believe I'm going to witness Jesus Christ coming back. I mean, how amazing is that going to be to see the, the Messiah come and all the tribes of the earth mourning over him as he comes back, like it says in Revelation chapter 1. We're going to see with our very own eyes Jesus Christ coming back to Jerusalem. What an incredible honor that is, but that tells us then that we have to be a certain kind of people. Amen? We've got to be strong. That strength does not come from the soul. That strength does not come from your muscles. That strength does not come from anything you do. That strength comes from Christ in you. That strength comes because the Spirit of God who raised Jesus from the dead now dwells in you. That, that strength comes because your spirit and the Holy Spirit are now one. You have a union, a spiritual union with Christ by which the strength of God. Now, God is, there's no even ability to describe how strong God is. God's strength is beyond human words. That strength is in you. Paul said, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. That word strengthen means inward strength. I can do, in the Greek, I can do all things through Christ who gives me inward strength. We're going to need that strength. We're going to need that peace. We're going to need those things to overcome because I'm telling you, the times we're living in are God is shaking heaven and earth. And so we're going to need that, that we're going to need his life you know, we're going to need that to be the kind of people he's looking for. So those are the six reasons why we need to learn how to live by the indwelling life of Christ. Now, I want to talk about just for a second is how can you get the most out of this class? If you really want to learn how to live by the indwelling life of Jesus Christ, it's going to require from you much more than listening to an hour sermon on Sunday. You will never, you know, even if God was to give me the ability to preach like George Whitfield or Jonathan Edwards, you know, or whatever, even then you would still not be able to live by the indwelling life of Christ from, from a person getting up here, no matter how eloquent they would be, no matter the best preacher of Billy Graham got up here and taught it, you cannot learn how to live by the indwelling life of Jesus Christ by hearing a one-hour sermon. 
See, you've got to put effort into it. You've got to put energy into it. You've got to put it, incorporate this into your prayer life. How do you get the most um, from this class? Is that, you know, if I could say, you know, we did that, that, that series a while back about 50 things I would tell my 50-year-old self when I was 25. Or my, 50 things I would tell at 50 to my 25-year-old self. The number one thing I'll put is master the spirit-led life. Master the spirit-led life. That is what I would say again. I mean, it, it, is, it is vital that we learn how to master this spirit-led life. And so um, one, of the things, one of the things I love about books is when you read a book, you can learn in 30 days what sometimes took an author 30 years to learn. That's incredible. We need to value books more than we value books because there's so much you can get out of books, out of classes. This class, you, we're gonna have, it's going to be about a, a five-month class, probably taught over six months with holidays and breaks and home groups and stuff like that. You can learn in six months what took me 15 years to learn, 15 years of study, 15 years of prayer, 15 years of waiting on the Lord. You can learn in six months. That is incredible. <laughs> That, but it also comes with a responsibility. We can't, just like, we can't just like say, okay, I'm going to listen to a one-hour message and think I've got it. No, that's not going to cut it. That's not going to get it. So this, this class is, is so much more than you listening to me teach. It's about you going to the Lord yourself and saying, Lord, I want you to teach me how to live by your indwelling life. So here's my encouragement to us for these next six months, is ask the Lord. Make it your goal. Make it your ambition. Is over these next six months, I want to master the Spirit-led life. I want to learn how to live the Spirit-led life. Lord, would you teach me? I, I, want you, I want this class to be more of a catalyst to move you to the Lord and away from anything I would say move you to the Lord so the Lord himself teaches you. Now, I hope that he might use this book that's coming out on October 18th. I hope he will because it took a lot of effort. But, I mean, at the end of the day, it doesn't, and if you learn how to live by the indwelling life of Christ and you don't need the book, that's awesome, you know? So, but I, I hope the Lord might use this class or use this book or whatever. But the ultimate goal in this is not for you to be dependent on me as a teacher, but you to get to the Lord and the Lord himself to teach you. So my encouragement to you is say, okay, Lord, if you make it, this is what I, I found. If you make a goal, my goal is to learn how to live by the indwelling life of Christ over these next six months. So that's going to be my goal. I'm going to go deeper in this. You know, you have a goal as well. I want, to go, I want to learn how to live by the indwelling life of Christ. No matter if you're just at the beginning, no matter if you've been doing this longer than me, no matter if you're somewhere in between, is I want to learn how to live by the indwelling life of Jesus Christ over these next six months. I am going to go to the Lord and say, Lord, train me. Teach me how to live by the indwelling life of Jesus Christ. I've been, I've been doing this for years, asking the Lord, okay, teach me, teach me, train me. And, you know, for 15 years or so, I've been really just, okay, how do you do it? How do you do it? So a lot of times we, we hear about, okay, you need to live by the indwelling life of Christ. We need to live by the indwelling life of Christ. But a lot of times we're never told, okay, how do you do it? How do you do it? How do you actually do it? What do you do? It's, it's more than just knowing, okay, I need to do it. I think everyone here knows, okay, I need to do it. The question is, how? How do I do it? That's what this class, I hope, uh, is going to really explain to you. How do you do this? And so the other thing is, is as we go through this class, my goal is to, is to teach, but to help equip you so you can experience it for yourself. And the way I think about this is like this. So, uh, in 2019, um, for Angie's birthday, I surprised her. I can never surprise her. She, I mean, anytime I've ever surprised her, she finds a, a gift in the closet or I don't know. She always figures out, okay, she always figures out my surprises, so I hardly even try anymore. Um, but on, on, for her birthday, January 4th, 2019, 
I gave her a, an itinerary to Ireland because we had had this desire in our hearts to go to Ireland for, since we got married in 1999. For, so for our 20th anniversary, I gave her an I Ireland itinerary, and she was just like overwhelmed, shocked, like, what is this for? Like, we're going to Ireland for our 20th anniversary. And her, uh, her, Angie's mother had connected me with a travel agent, and the travel agent had been to Ireland, and it was just was like, okay, you're going to love it. You're going to love Ireland, okay? She started interviewing me and finding, okay, this is what you want to do. This is what I recommend you doing. See, the travel agent had been there and had experienced Ireland, so she could, as a travel agent, as a guide, she could write up an itinerary that would help us, me and Angie, experience Ireland that we, in the way we wanted to experience Ireland. And so, you know, a lot of things, we followed the travel agent's guide, um, but in a lot of ways, we didn't follow her guide. We had our own experience. And that's kind of the way I hope this class is for you, is that, that this is almost like a guide to help you. Okay, here's some things you need to learn. Here's some things you need to think about. Here's some things that hopefully serve as a framework for you so that you can have your own experience with Jesus Christ. That's, that's really the goal of this, is not just to give you knowledge, not just to give you information, but to give you a framework and some guidelines, a travel guide, so to speak, so that you can go to the Lord yourself in your time with Him and go deeper in the Lord than you've ever gone before. So that's kind of the, the goal I'm, I'm hoping in this, is that this will help you experience that, um, to go deeper and deeper in Him than ever before. So this class is going to be taught over, just to give you a quick overview of this class there's going to be, we're going to, including this session, which is the introduction, there's going to be 20 sessions. I'm going to teach it in three different parts. Part one is going to be the abiding life. It's going to be four sessions. Uh, the abiding life part, part, part one, is basically the, the title of it is the abiding life. And the idea of part one is to talk to you about, is God created you to abide in him? The way he created you, spirit, soul, and body, it was uniquely designed by the Lord so that you could live the abiding life. And when you understand the way God created you, spirit, and I would also say heart, soul, body, when you understand the way God created you, it helps you live the abiding life. When you don't understand the way God created you, then it's impossible to live the abiding life. You're trying to relate to Jesus who dwells in heaven, and no, the Lord's like, no, I live inside of you. Your spirit and, and my spirit are connected. And learning about these things in the body and the soul and the heart, learning that you were created this way helps you live the abiding life. So that's going to be part one. We'll talk about hindrances. There's hindrances to the abiding life. Uh, natural strength, self-reliance, the rational mind, emotions and experiences, the, the body itself, those things are hindrances that we must overcome. I mean, how many of you think you need to overcome some emotions to live by the indwelling life of Christ? I mean, how many of us realize, okay, I've got a lot of emotions that are lying to me, telling me things that I'm living and I'm believing, and those are just emotions. And if we live by emotions, no matter even if they're feel-good emotions that make you feel good, if we live by emotions, we'll never learn how to live by the indwelling life of Christ. They're hindrances if we live by emotions. Emotions are meant to be a servant, not the leader. If we're led by emotions, we'll not be led by the Holy Spirit. The rational mind, thinking, logic, Reasoning, that would be one of my biggest ones. I'm very much in my mind as I've got to overcome the natural mind to learn how to live by the Spirit. So those are hindrances to the, the abiding life. Part two is we'll get into the treasure of Christ in you. The, the, the part two is going to be five sessions. Part two, the treasure of Christ in you. We'll talk about who Christ is in you and how he has transformed your spirit. Christ in you is God's glory. Christ in you is rivers of living water. Christ in you is, uh, Christ in you is resurrection life, power for ability, creative power. Christ in you is the kingdom of God. Christ in you is the helper. Christ in you is the truth. Christ in you is the anointing. As you learn how, about the treasure of Jesus Christ in you, it will get you out of spiritual poverty into the true wealth that you have in Jesus Christ and to learn to live by his spirit. We'll also look at your new spirit and how he has transformed your spirit. And then part three, the spirit that life, there'll be 10 sessions where I go through 10 different keys 
that I have learned in my journey of how to live the, by the indwelling life of Christ, 10 different keys of how to live by his life, okay? So that's where this class is going. Okay. I, this, this part right now, I know I've seen some people looking at their watches. I won't name names. I know you, little people are like, okay, it's getting long-winded here. Um, actually, it hasn't. I haven't gone, been going for an hour, I don't think, yet. Uh, I, I, so bear with me because this part right here is very important. This is what I, waiting on the Lord this morning, this is what I felt like the Lord was saying to us at Restoration Life, those who are enrolled in our four-winter school, those who are going to listen to this in Africa through life school, is I really sensed as I was, I was waiting on the Lord, even when I was writing this class, I sensed a, a real special anointing on this class. Okay, that has nothing to do with me, all right? I am a very flawed human vessel, and as I get older, I realize how much more flaws I have. So this has nothing to do with me. This is all about the Lord. And the invitation the Lord is giving us. But I really felt when I was writing this class, this is a special class. Um, not because of me, all right, because of the Lord and the, the season we live in. And I just sensed that, okay, there's a real special anointing that God is giving us. That it's because the time is urgent, the need is great, and God is gracious, because of those three things, there's a, I believe God is going to take my flaws, which are many, and he's going to hopefully get rid of the, I mean, at least suppress them for a few minutes, and hopefully let the anointing come and do a deep work in all of us. But I believe that the Lord is going to use this class. This is what I wrote in my notes, which Bethany's saying. Uh, I sense the Lord will use this class to do a deep work in us. For those who are hungry, humble, and who take this class seriously, grace is going to be released for personal revival and inward transformation. I believe God is going to release a, a, a special grace over these six months for the humble and the hungry to do a, a work of, of inward transformation and personal revival. This invitation is for a visitation that will produce transformation to those who believe this and take the next six months seriously. That this, the grace released in the next six months will help you be made ready as a bride and to stand strong in the end times. So let me just say a couple cautions here. Is beware, I've been doing this long enough to know when the Lord moves, this goes all the way back even to the time when Noel was coming in the mid-90s. When the Lord moves in a unique way, in a special way, it's very easy to miss it. It's very easy to look at the human vessel, to look at the flaws of the human vessel. Uh, you don't have to look far for mine if you, if you want to, so I can point some out if you need me to. To look at the flaws of the human vessel and miss what the Lord is wanting to do. I've seen this since the mid-90s. That like the Jews in the first century, you can miss the visitation. Uh, uh, you can miss the visitation for an inward move of God by not recognizing the season we're in. I believe God is giving us a season, a window of six months, an invitation from the Lord that He's going to do in you. This is God. I believe, and I hope God will use me and use this book and use these classes or whatever. Use this class. But God, this is about you and your relationship with God. Look to the Lord to, for him to do it. I just believe that God's going to do an incredibly deep work if you will recognize and discern the invitation for the visitation. See, Jesus told the Jews, he said, he, he began to weep over Jerusalem and he said, you did not recognize the hour of your visitation. See, God comes in seasons. God comes in times, and it's very easy for us. It's very easy for us because we're so busy, aren't we? We're so busy. We've got so much going on. It's very easy for us to not recognize that hour of visitation when God wants to do something special because of the busyness. So that, that is a warning I believe the Lord is giving us in this. Another warning is you can receive this class in various depths, okay? You can receive this class in various depths. You can receive it, 
Well, some people, I probably won't receive anything out of this. You know, it's, they'll just be like, yeah, okay. He talked for a long time and talked about indwelling life, but we'll receive nothing out of it. Some are going to receive 30-fold. Some are going to receive 60-fold. Some are going to receive 100-fold. This is the warning, though, I believe the Lord gave. And the challenge in the warning is that if you receive 30-fold, you will not even know that you could have received 60-fold. You will not even know or realize you could have received 100-fold. You see what I'm saying? You won't even know that, okay, you got 30-fold. God did something. It was good. But you could have had better and you could have had best. And the thing is, is when we get 30-fold return, we don't even know, okay, I could have had more. See what I'm saying? That's a challenge to me as well. I'm in this challenge as well. I want to get a hundredfold return out of this. I don't want an outer court return. I don't want a holy place return. I don't want, I want a holy of holies return on this. And so when I was praying, when I was praying on, when we were praying on this about this on Wednesday and I was praying about this this morning, the Lord just quickened. Just please pay attention. Just, I know we're getting fidgety. Please pay attention to this. This is very, very important. So turn into Mark chapter 4, verse 21. I'm going to read this out of the Amplified. Mark, and, and now that I'm reading out of the Amplified, we might be here until for a while. So Mark chapter 4, verse 21 from the Amplified. I want you to see this. And he said to them, a lamp is not brought in to be put under a basket or under a bed, is it? And the Lord's, if you read the context, the Lord's talking about the revelation that he wants to give. Okay, this is not, this is about the revelation that is coming. It's not to be, is it not brought in to be put on a lampstand? Verse 22, Nothing is hidden except to be revealed. And I believe God is going to reveal many things over this six-month season. Nor has anything been kept secret, but that it would come to light. That is, things are, things are hidden only temporarily until the appropriate time comes for them to be known. I believe this six months, for us at least, is a time when these things are meant to be made known. Now, this is where the challenge comes. I believe we, this is the invitation God's given us. Now, here's where the challenge comes to me and the challenge comes to you. If anyone has ears to hear, let him hear and heed my words. Now, this is verse 24. Pay attention to what you hear. Or you could say, Pay attention to how you hear. Pay attention. Pay attention to how you're listening. Pay attention to the scriptures you're reading. Pay attention to what you're reading. Pay attention. Here's what the Lord's saying here. By your own standard of measurement, that is to the extent that you study spiritual truth and apply godly wisdom, and I would say by developing a prayer life, it will be measured to you. And you will be given even greater ability to respond. And more will be given to you besides. I know that's the Amplified, it just extends. But here's what I'm saying is, if we put a small measure into this, we'll get a 30-fold return. If we put a greater measurement measure into this, we'll get a 60-fold return. If we, get a, if we put everything we've got into this, we'll get a 100-fold return. And so, the Lord's, I believe, challenging us, what measure, what standard of measure are you going to put into this effort? Because whatever standard of measure you put in will be the measure you get back, and more will be added to it. And the thing is, you don't know. See, here's the thing is, this, take this from an older man. You know, I can say that now. Anna raises her hand. Take this. You don't know what you don't know. You don't know going in 
what you could have had if you would have given it every single thing you've got in this. And you will never know until, it, until you meet the Lord. And again, this is not about me. This is about the Lord. You don't know what the Lord would have done in you until you actually take the step of faith and go for it with everything you've got. For whoever has, and it says here, a teachable heart, to him more understanding will be given. And whoever does not have a yearning for truth, even what he has will be taken away. And so my exhortation to us my exhortation to us is to take these next, next six months serious, okay? And I don't mean you can't have joy, but I mean take them very, very serious because God wants to do a deep, deep work in you and in me. We need it. Oh, how desperately we need it. How desperately the church needs it for the hour we live in. So the other thing that we're going to do in this class is we're gonna have, I'm going to have a section for each, at, at the end of each session of applying what you learn because I don't want to just teach you and then you not apply it. I want to hopefully get you to apply it. Okay, how can I apply what I've just heard? So I'm gonna, uh, in the application section, I'm going to have some questions that I want to encourage you to answer uh, in your time with the Lord. This is about you and the Lord. It's not about me. You can take these for what these are worth, you know, whatever they're worth, you know, to, to hopefully, hopefully kind of uh, mo motivate you some. But th the application for this introduction, just a couple things here. I would highly recommend that you get a, a journal or a notebook to record your prayers, your questions, and your meditations. Now, I've found this to be very helpful. Write down what your prayers are. Write down the scriptures. Write down your questions. Um, Ask the Lord in your time with the Lord these questions. What does it mean to me that Christ dwells in me? Why is it important to live by Christ in dwelling life? And how does living by his life help me in my everyday life? Okay, so these questions are in the notes. If you want to get them online, you can get them. The second thing, I, the next thing I would say is prayerfully, okay, listen, prayerfully write down your goal for this class. What do you want the Lord to accomplish in you over these next six months? Write it down prayerfully as if you're saying, okay, Lord, over these next six months, I want you to do this in me, okay? What do you want the Lord to do over these next six months? What do you want him to do in you? My, this is what I'm going to, this is mine, is, is Lord, I want Revelation 12, 11 to become real in me. He did not love his life even unto death. I want a deeper work of the cross of Jesus Christ to work in my self-life to put me to death so the rising of Christ would come up in fullness, a fuller measure of the increase of Christ. So that's, that's, you know, that's that. The, um, to help you, so once you've written your goal down prayerfully, is, is to answer these questions that I would encourage you to ask. Is there anything I need to surrender so that I have more time to spend in prayer and quiet meditation. TV, social media, video games, whatever. What is it that is hindering me from spending time with the Lord that I need to get rid of so that I can devote myself to the Lord in these six months? Number two is ask this question. I'm almost at the end. To ask this question, what time am I at my best? Am I at my best early in the morning? Am I at my best after lunch? Am I at my best before I go to bed? What time is it when you are at your best so that you can take that time when you are at your best and devote that time to the Lord, to give the Lord your best time? And then number three, are there any radical steps I need to take to position me to receive the most from this class. Is there anything radical? I mean, if you're struggling with lust, do I need to get rid of my TV? Do I need to get rid of my computer? Do I need to break off a relationship? If I'm struggling with something, do I need to break it off? What are the radical steps I need to take so I can get the most out of this season? So, uh, the, the last thing I'm going to say here is that what breathing is to living Praying, meditation, and scripture reading is to the indwelling life of Jesus Christ. Prayer, and it's not transactional prayer where I'm trying to get God to do something for me. 
It's conversational prayer. It's relational prayer. This relational, conversational relationship with the Lord. Now, there's a place for transactional prayer, but I, I've found that if I will develop my relational life with the Lord and my conversation with the Lord, the transactional prayer comes way easier. I can just say, Lord, do this, do that, and he does it. Whereas if you're just transactional, you have to cry out and plead and bang your head for God to answer. When it comes out of intimacy, it happens a lot faster. <clears throat> so that's why, you're, that's why to, to really learn how to live by the indwelling life of Christ, it's going to come out of your own personal prayer life. So if you struggle with meeting with the Lord, if, you, if that's a real struggle for you, you may not be, but if it's a struggle for you, then I would encourage you to schedule time with the Lord and say, okay, I'm going to meet with the Lord Monday, Wednesday, and Friday from 6 to 7, and I'm going to do this, this, and this. Schedule it. If that's a struggle for you, schedule it. Okay? So those are the applications. Amen. I think, I think God is going to do a great work. Let me pray. Okay, thank you for being patient. Um, Father, we just come to you right now. And Lord, even as we sing in worship and even as we were just the prophetic confirmations, Lord, our heart, just agree with me, whether online, whether in person, agree with me if this is your heart. Lord, we want you to do a deep work in us. Lord, we want to go deeper than we have ever gone. Lord, we don't want, Lord, I, I don't want, if, you, if this is you as well, agree with me, I don't want to settle for a 30-fold return. Lord, let this settle into our hearts right now. Lord, let us not settle for a 30-fold return and be content with it. Confront our lukewarmness, Lord, over this issue. Lord, I pray that I would not settle for a 60-fold return. A holy place return. Lord, I'm asking you in me, I'm asking you for those who are agreeing with me who want this, Lord, that you would give us a hundred-fold return. A holy of holies return that we would put in the effort by the Holy Spirit, not by the soul, but by the Spirit, the way you lead us, the effort and the energy that we could go to new levels in the Lord that we've never gone to before. Whether we're beginning, whether we've been on this journey for decades, whether we're somewhere in between, that we could go on this journey and go deeper than we've ever gone before, Lord, we pray. So I'm asking you, for the hungry and the humble who will take this serious, mark us, Lord, over these next six months. Mark us and seal us, Lord, that we might be able to get everything we need to get out of this class. I pray that, Lord, in the name of Jesus. Amen. 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 We'll end the online here. God bless you.